Good evening. Um, hi. Uh, we just would like to uh, have you um, to you know state your name, your occupation, or and um, what you uh, did in the war, uh, mm. World War Two. You believe? I'm happy to do that. Right. Wonderful. Shall I? Yeah. Yes. Very good. Good evening, everybody. My name is Paul Ware. I'm retired. For 24 years now. I was in World War II, toward the end, more or less. I enlisted in the Navy, so to speak. That is to say, I signed up voluntarily when I was in the 12th grade to join the Navy Air Pilot Training Program known as V-5. And uh, I was accepted. And several months after I graduated from high school, I was ordered to go to Pensacola, Florida, to the Naval Air Station there. When we arrived, there were about a hundred of us. And we had a short indoctrination into Navy life. And then, inasmuch as the Naval Air Station had five outlying airfields, the hundred of us were divided into 20 each group to go to each, so it, they had 20 at each of these five airports. So I was assigned to go to Whiting Field, which is north of Pensacola, probably about 30 or 40 miles, and is a very nice airport. We were shown 25 airplanes in a row. These were SNJ, also known as AT-6, also known as Texan aircraft. Each one of us was assigned one of those aircraft, personally. Our job was to gas them up, make sure they had enough oil on each flight, and to warm them up, start them up and warm them up so they could be ready for the flight crew, which would consist of an instructor and a student who was going to fly. Um, is one, is is one of those? Is that yes, that's exactly it. This is it. This is the SNJ. Uh, the instructor would be in the front seat and the student in the rear seat and they would fly. They'd close the canopies up there, completely in the greenhouse when they were aloft. And the instructor would tell the student what altitude to fly, what direction to fly, what speed to fly, and for how long. Then he'd give a turn, to make it turn a certain number of degrees and this pilot in the back had to make the plane turn while he watched only his instruments not being able to see the earth flying blind and get back to where he started hoping that drift didn't put him too far away and here's up for almost an hour before he comes down then we have to go through the job of gassing it up again well what do we do we start early in the morning because there's going to be more than one flight. So, about daybreak, I'll be out at the end of the runway where the, all the airplanes are on the flight line. I'll go to my airplane because it's a cool morning. And uh, this was in the winter of 1943. 40, 40, okay, uh, quite old. In Mobile Bay, there was ice, so it's quite cold out there. And those cylinders here are quite cold, and the oil is driven, dripped down overnight, and it's thickened. So I've got to turn this prop over by hand before I fair, dare do that. I must go up here and open this canopy up and put the magneto switch on and off. So by some unlikely happening, I, I, it won't ignite when I turn that prop and press the gas. So I'll turn it over several times. And I can tell when it's getting a little lubricated. And when that's done, then I go back here and I gas up on this wing tank here, fill it up with gas. Then I open the little door here and check the oil level. If needed, I add oil and invariably will because these engines, let me tell you, these engines are 600 horsepower. The plane is about 32 feet long. The wingspan's 33 or 34, it can do, uh, in um, the uh, navigational training, 
and you can equip it with a 30 caliber machine gun and do gunnery, or you can hang bombs underneath and do uh, uh, iron bomb drops and so forth. It uses a lot of oil. Well, after done that, now I've got to start it up. To do that, I have to go back aft of this cockpit. There's a little opening here. I can open it up with a 25 cent piece. It's called a Zeus fastener. Opens up a door in the metal fuselage. There is a crank inside like that. And it's secured against the wall with clips. And I pull it out and I take it up. And I climb back up here and there's a hole here. And inside that hole is an axle that goes into a very heavy flywheel. And this crank has slits in it that engage bosses in that, in that uh, crank, the crankshaft of that flywheel. And I start to turn it over. It's very stiff but, and hard to get going. But fairly pretty soon, you get it going fast, you get up to a speed of whining, and you're ready to start this airplane. Now, before you do that, though, a couple of things you have to do. Like I say, I had the magnetos on off. Now, when I go to start it and wind that thing up, I've got to put those magnetos on full. It says off, left magneto, right magneto, both magnetos. So put it on both magnetos so every cylinder will have a magneto spark for the gasoline when it goes to ignite. I have to must put the mixture on rich and put the throttle absolutely back in right position. Okay, with that done, then I can crank it up like I just said. Now up here forward is a little ring that's big enough to put on your finger and pull. It's connected to a metal wire that's very flexible. That's the clutch that's going to engage a fast flywheel with the uh, drive shaft for this propeller. It's like letting out the clutch when you're learning to drive a manual shift car. You pull that out with your left finger. In the meantime, walking back aft here, you reach in. And you hand on that throttle, you're listening for the ignition, and when you hear it, you work this throttle to sort of baby that engine into a smooth purr. And when you've got that, you know you've got it running, and you keep it down there, and let it warm up, and wait for the crew to come. And they come, and they get in, and then I'll be uh, removing the chocks from underneath these wheels. You can't see them here, and they're retracted. This photo was in flight. Uh, but the wheels are chalked so it won't move forward. And I'm very careful not to blow myself off this wing by pushing the throttle up. Just leave it like where it is. So they get in. Now they're ready to come out. The wheels are free. And I give them a signal to pull out this way because they can't see over this in a cell here. They have to see only this way or this way. So I have to direct the instructor who's at the, um, going to bring it out on the, on the taxiway how to come up and then point to his left brake to bring him around it so that his left wing tip will clear on a good radius and his tail will not hit, hit uh, either tail wheel will not hit the chalk block or the airplane next to him. And I get him out on the runway, then he's ready to take over. I leave him, he goes off, I have nothing to do until he comes back. So I go in this little check we have on the end of the runway where there's a poker game going with a third or first class aircraft machinist mate running the thing, but I don't involve myself in poker. I've got nothing to do for an hour. But it's ice cold when I stand and keep warm, no seats to sit down all day long. That goes on all day, and when it's all over, everybody's back in. I get off. I go eat. Next morning, back at dawn. Three months every day. They're always flying, unless there's rain. They can fly in the rain, but none of it's too bad, because they'll have trouble recording. Now, that was everything I did at Whiting Field.